wow, let's, uh, let's do this. <laughs> I wasn't expecting so many people, so uh, thank you for joining. And I'm going to try to give you an overview of all of the features that were announced during Google I.O., which were a lot. And if you remember, or if you saw the, some videos on social media, it was basically a minute of the CEO saying AI, 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 AI. And you could hear it consistently. And some people were joking that you could take shots and you would end Google I.O. completely smashed. Uh, that was people attending Google I.O. Uh, that, was, that was fun. So let's start with my name. So I'm not French. I'm originally from Barcelona and I'm Gerard Sanz. So if you want to reach out to me, that's my uh, handle. You can just send me a message. I'm all day on Twitter, day and night. So that's easy, easy enough. I'm a Google developer expert, which for a lot of people is like, okay, what is that? Uh, well, this is a title or um, acknowledgement from Google for the people that is very active in the community. Like myself, that I travel from London to join you here and Berlin received me with a big storm that I got completely uh, wet. But yeah, more or less. But, but now London is sunny. Here, you can see that this is not my first talk. I've been all over the place, uh, maybe in some places that you have uh, never been. OK, of course, it's not going to work. So let's talk about Google I.O. So Google I.O. was mainly about AI. Other years, maybe we have seen the focus on other products, uh, Firebase recently, but this year is the year of AI. And one of the main products would be MakerSwift. And maybe you, you never thought about that, but now that the last six months have been all about ChatGPT and all the generative AI everywhere on the news, this is the tool from uh, Google to do what is called prompt engineering. What is that? So prompt engineering is the design of your prompts and Google has presented this tool that you can use. For now, it's only available in the US. <laughs> so this is kind of a, a preview, but it's gonna be soon available in Europe and the rest of the world. You can see a little bit how it works. Uh, if you cannot see it, I'm gonna tell you that's, um, that's an assistant that will write the emails uh, for you and it just needs a little context of what is the objective and then you can ask for it to write uh, a certain email. So you can uh, use this again and again as you need it. There's few other details, but one is released. You can, uh, you can go into it and play a little bit around. There's other products that has been announced. This is uh, really exciting. Duet AI. I don't know if you have seen any demos. So basically what you have maybe used is a chat, which is mainly an interaction with questions and answers. But this is the next level, which is an assistant that will follow your instructions and will change. For example, in this example, it will create an event in, a, in Google Sheets for you. So it's mixing the two capabilities. So it's creating actions within a tool and also following the generative AI that you already know. Of course, this is not new. You can also use this as a developer. And uh, this is still not released but it's gonna be released soon. And here you can see the same chat experience, but in Google Cloud. So that means that while in your editor, you could send some commands that, for example, you want to deploy um, a thing in the cloud, it will do it for you. So you actually don't need to memorize all of the commands, et cetera. Or if you have any doubts, it can answer those for you. All right. Okay. 
Of course, the main thing that everybody is thinking about when you see these AIs messing around with your Google Docs, I mean, Google Docs are not that dangerous, but doing other things independently or autonomously is what things you don't want the AI to do. And this is how the principles of responsible AI were born. So here are some of them. And probably a lot of people look into the red area, which is making sure that the AI that you build is not harmful, that is not used for surveillance, and other things that you shouldn't be doing. All right, so this is the first section. I'm going to try to go uh, over some uh, GIFs. Oh, it's, it's, it's broken now. <laughs> So let's go with a little introduction. I don't know how many of you are familiar with AI, so I'm gonna do this. I mean, I guess some of you have already seen it. So artificial intelligence. So this is um, where we try to imitate human intelligence. We are trying to mimic by following what a human will do. And then we'll try to replicate that using a machine. I mean, in general uh, terms. Then we have machine learning. And machine learning is basically unsupervised, which is a little bit scary, but it's very scalable, which is a word that we love as developers. So we just throw some massive amounts of data to a machine learning algorithm, and we just leave it until we get the results, more or less. That's what machine learning is doing. And then we get into the exciting bit, which is all of this new wave of AI and generative AI, which are the neural networks. So let's look at some examples just to see that these are very common. And we have seen also some big milestones. And just to remind some of them, we have AlphaFold, which is a massive, a massive uh, achievement. And I don't know if you can see the difference. So in, in just a few years, we have gone to a, a greater, much greater detail. And a lot of laboratories are using this information to actually simulate the effects of proteins without having to use mouse or other means. All right. Of course, every one of you uses some sort of voice assistant. I don't need to uh, go much into it. Of course, this is a classic. Google Translate, a lot of people may be crying both in the teams of assistants and Google Translate because now generative AI is like smashing everything on the way. But these are like the relics uh, from the past, like the old AI. <clears throat> Let's go into neural networks. And you will see that it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. So here we have an example with an image of a cat, and then we have the neural network with the task of classifying that picture in either being a cat or a dog. Of course, we need to label these pictures so we can do this uh, automatically, and then after all the training, the neural network will be able to do this uh, reliably. And that's it. So pretty much you need a good uh, a scenario when you can label and provide a good set of examples and then hopefully the neural network will converge and give you like a good result. All right, I hope it wasn't too much. I don't know if you are all experts and I'm just making a fool of myself, but uh, I had to do it as an intro, okay? So what I wanted to talk today is about Vertex AI, which sounds like very futuristic. Like, what is that, Vertex AI? Well, that's the new platform for generative AI, where you can create your own models, you can deploy them, you can uh, do fine tuning, all the cool stuff that we love. And of course, we can use that to build nice products like BART, or also play around with Palm, which will give us all these new features from generative AI. So this is just the intro. <laughs> and for Vertex AI, so this is a full service that will give you all of the options. Of course, some of them are a little bit more 
uh, will require more knowledge from you, but some of them will just be giving you APIs to use the models from Palm, let's say. So you can create a chatbot. Of course, there's a lot that you can do. And this is just a way to embrace the new generative AI wave. There's hundreds of models. There's some of them that they are open source. Some of them are native from Google Cloud. It's really exciting. Some of them, are, these are the, the key ones. Palm 2, which is the new release from Palm, and spe specifically for text and chat. And then we don't have time today to cover embeddings. I, I know that some of you love embeddings and vectors and all that, and semantic search and uh, agents, but it's too much for an intro. But that's what you can do with Vertex AI. And this is really exciting because we had nothing before. Let's go over the foundational models. So of course we have Pound, and here are some of the, what will be these, the code names. So if you actually want to use the APIs, these will be the code names, and these are all of them. The only one that is not released yet is the text to image, which is still not available unless you have uh, an invite, which uh, maybe you have. But you can see that there's plenty of things to play around. Okay. If you want to try, I show you what was the maker suite, which is uh, a much nicer experience, but this is what you find in Vertex. So if you want to design your prompts and play around with the different options, you can come and just play with this uh, interface. As you can see, it's a split into language, speech, and vision. And these, some of these are not so popular. For example, for speech, there's not much people talking about speech, but this is also an exciting development. And then for vision, maybe you have seen some examples uh, from the open source community, but this is the first uh, effort from, uh, from Google Cloud. Maybe you, you heard about Imogen. Now it's going to be integrated, and maybe we will have all the models there, so that's also exciting. This is an overview. There's a lot that you can do, and I just wanted to show you some of the options. I'm not going to go through all of them. So you can pick, basically, you can do all that you can uh, do today with a chat, everything that you can do with a code. So you can use that idea of Duet AI and maybe build that for your own products. Of course, voice. I think there's going to be a new wave of voice enabled applications that is looking like really, really, really cool. Today I was seeing a demo of less than a second response for a generative voice. And that was from, uh, anyone knows who released it just today? Oh, I forgot the name. But the open source community is really active and uh, there's a lot of progress there. So I, I would imagine that we will see the same in Vertex. Then we also have image, so there will be a lot of options. Some of them are behind a wait list, uh, but for now you can try some of those already are in general availability. All of these options come with a chat version of it, so you can use that conversation style to do, uh, for example, image editing or some other cool stuff. So Google has, has a partnership with Adobe Firefly. So it can be a, mix, a mixture between Imogen, a new version of the Imogen model, and maybe some collaboration with Adobe Firefly. Uh, Adobe Firefly is now available, so you can go and, and give it a try. I would say it's not in the frontier, which would be, as you, as you mentioned, mid-journey. But this is changing very quickly. I mean, a few months ago, maybe uh, stable diffusion was a little farther. Now they are almost giving you the same features and probably the next month it's gonna be like everyone is doing exactly the same. So that's, uh, I mean, that's really exciting if you are in this, in this area. Okay, <laughs> so let's, let's go. Everyone loves these cats. So let's go with Bart. So Bart, just release a new version of it, and it's quite cool. The main thing is adding images. 
And here you can see one example. So you can just throw, throw it an image and it will give you the details. If you have guessed, that's Google Lens. I mean, if you have used Google Lens for translation or maybe other uh, tasks, they added that as a tool for BART. So if you send it an image, it will try to find what is in, in the image. It will try to describe what is in there. Also BART, I don't know if you uh, knew this detail, but BART is able to decide if it throws a Google search into the mix. So it's not trying to answer the question from its own training, but if it finds that it can do a Google search, it will use that. There's other things that I tried. This one was just give it a picture of few ingredients and then it figures out what are you cooking. I mean, of course, I wasn't cooking that. I took a picture uh, from the internet. But there's also some other news. You can now listen to the response. Imagine you are in your car or you cannot use um, your mobile. You can now listen to the response. And you have now support for more than 40 languages. Actually, the model from Google Chirp is working to support a hundred languages. And that's going to be probably one of the next uh, achievements or milestones. So that's being on uh, being cook at the moment. And of course, code. I don't know if every, every one of you is a developer, but this is uh, quite exciting, depending on what tools and uh, what languages you use. But you can just, if you are a web, developer, you can just throw like a form, like a literally a screenshot of a form. I mean, you shouldn't take it from the competence, but you just throw in a form and it will just code it in the language that you ask. So I ask Angular because I'm an Angular uh, developer. So that I tried for everything that I, I imagine. I tried for Svelte, I tried for Vue 2, Vue 3, Next, whatever you, I mean, Maybe some of the less known languages, uh, maybe one like Marco <laughs> won't, won't work. But if you give it examples, then it can figure it out. So it's pretty amazing. This is something, if you haven't tried BART to do these things, maybe you should. Some things that they added in the, in the new release is uh, integration with different tools. And if you get a code snippet, maybe you want to try it out. So you can move it to a collab or use it in Replit. So that's, that's uh, really cool. Or if you are writing a message, you can move it to a, an email. New features coming. We have, as I was mentioning, the Adobe Firefly integration. So now you can imagine this in, in, some, in some time, you will be able to ask to image, uh, generate uh, from BART. And you can also mix with other features. So you can throw it an image, look what is in the image, and then generate something that is similar to the image that you uh, proposed. So plenty of uh, possibilities there. Some other things. This is a little bit maybe difficult to uh, assimilate. You can connect BART. Maybe you have seen this with ChatGPT. You can connect BART to different tools, but third-party tools. So imagine you are planning a new trip and you are using maybe kayak usually, or you're using some other, some other third party. Now you can do the whole order in BART. So you could also speak to it. Like I want whatever you fancy that night and it will connect to Uber Eats, build the order. Of course, it, it, it asks you to confirm. <laughs> It won't do it on its own, but maybe, maybe if you give it that uh, privilege, it will do it in the future. So pretty exciting. That's usually the response, the reactions. Okay, Palm. So let's introduce a little bit of the different models that are planned. For now, we only have Bison, I think it's the pronunciation, but there's also plan for other sizes. This, uh, uh, pointing to the size of the model. Um, just some interesting facts. There's also a new trend on specialized models. For now, all of the models that maybe you have seen in the press, these are what is called general, generalists. They have been trained with no purpose. They have been just thrown in the internet. They have taken everything that they, uh, they could 
and then come back making poems and songs. But these are another generation. These are trained on a specific domain. So this is uh, something that we will see more. We have another model which is specialized, and this one is specialized in security. Of course, we are getting very close to the point that we can speak a language, it will take the language, pass it to a, through a model, it will speak it out, and we will be able to just communicate with everyone. And that means, unfortunately, that means that we can work with everyone. So our teams will be really diverse. Not because we won, but our bosses won. And that's gonna happen. That's gonna happen. Look at this. Can you believe it? I mean, it's, it's difficult to believe, but it's gonna happen. Okay. Let's go very quickly over this information. So this is a little bit of technical details, if you are into that. This is um, when it was released, what is the size of the, of the latest model, what was the information. This is still generalist, so it's not specialized. So you can imagine you will get maybe a specialized model later on. So how it works. I don't know if you, if you ever thought like, okay, so what is happening in uh, Palms to mine during the training. So I'm gonna show you an example. We take a Wikipedia article from the web crawl, and this is the work that Palm is trying to do. is reading the article and trying to figure it out the next work. Of course, the next work, this is an uh, unsupervised process. So it's just Palm. There's no help, there's nobody else here. It's just Palm reading the Wikipedia ar article. And of course, Palm knows the next word, which is Columbus, but still tries to guess. That is a failure. Christopher Columbus was, I mean, it was a good guess, but it failed because it's discovered, actually. But there's a point that Palm makes it right. And this is when Palm will adjust the neural network to direct the model into that specific um, like text that we, that we have seen, and so on and so forth. Of course, at the end, it's going to converge because now it's very much is the, is the site here. And that's it. I think it was easy enough to understand, no? So that, that's happening just millions and millions of times. And not only about a fact, a historic fact, but anything, code, is looking at recipes, is looking at uh, websites, is looking at all the corpus of data during the training and doing this exact same exercise. So what is happening inside? Well, what Palm is doing is trying to build this hyperdimensional graph, which will give it exactly the weights and the relations that Palm has seen in the training. This is also very important because if you give it something ridiculous, like maybe a long list of ones and zeros, it will learn how to predict ones and zeros. So you need to be very aware of the quality of the training data. Okay. Warning. I mean, you already may know this, the biases, the fantasy, and also really, really easy operations, they come in with uh, inaccuracies, which is a little bit perplexing because it can move from really, really accurate to really, really uh, inaccurate. So this is a warning. If you are implementing this into a real world project, be aware of these things and don't overpromise. This is how it looks. If you think like after the training and we are looking now at the latent space with all the relations and all the data points from the training. These are now words. And when we put the focus in one word, we see the neighbors. And then that's how the model tries to figure out what will be the next word when we uh, try to predict or follow a prompt. Okay. Very good. Well done. 
Let's talk about the future. Who has heard about Google Gemini? Very cool. So this is the next generation after Palm tool. It will come Google Gemini. And Google Gemini will be a multimodal generative uh, AI model that will be able to take not only text, but images, video, audio, and anything that you can imagine that it's uh, worth looking into. Let's see what happens, but it's really promising. So you can imagine all of the models that we have seen before, we won't need them. We just will need Gemini, which will replace all of the different models. Really exciting. And I hope I have inspired you <laughs> to look into generative AI. I mean, I don't know if you already were uh, a fan of the idea. I'm going to give a more detailed talk using Angular and using Vertex, actually using it. And it's going to be on Thursday. And that's the end. I have a little demo. I don't know if I have uh, a couple of minutes to, uh, to run it. I, have, uh, I guess I have. <laughs> Just, I'm going to glance over some. So this is, this is an Angular project. And I just put together the API and also the code. And the only thing that I, I'm going to do is I'm going to just run some prompt. Nothing too crazy. I'm just setting the stage, setting the credentials, the API key, and sending the prompt. If I look at the prompt, if we look at the prompt, it looks something like this. If you are familiar with this, uh, hyperparameters, you will uh, understand what's going on there. I'm not going, I'm not going to explain, but that's the request. So we are just going to send the prompt with all this configuration and see what is the response. This is working. I mean, this should work. It's running. And let's just see. All right. So let's go back to the prompt. The prompt was, what is the largest number with a name? <clears throat> Anybody knows? Google Plex. Google Plex, exactly. Let's see if Palm knows about that. The largest number with a name is Google Plex. A Google Plex is a one followed by a <clears throat> hundred zeros. How exhilarating. We are at Google. <laughs> and this is actually what inspired the name of the company. How, how cool is that? If you have any questions, you can come, come to me later. <laughs>